So yes, I will um, give you a brief summary of, of where we're at with Sammy and Hector. Um, we live in particularly exciting times. We're basically transitioning into the, the Hector era. Hector's not on the telescope now. You can see that picture on the right-hand side is, is Hector on the A80. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. For those of you who um, may not be aware, I just want to give you a very brief intro to Sammy. Um, Sammy is a survey that used the Sammy instrument, the Sydney AO multi-object integral field spectrograph, uh, which is 13 IFUs across a one degree field of view. Uh, and we targeted over 3,000 galaxies with that instrument in a survey um, running for several years that finished in 2018 um, in both the gamma regions that have this exquisite multi wavelength spectroscopic coverage, but also cluster fields that give us a really rich, dense environment. So all that data is now public. Um, so if you haven't already, um, do have a look on Data Central um, and look at the, the data. There's a huge array of different data products there. Um, just some key points about um, the survey. Typically, we sub out to a roughly 1.4 RE, so sort of reasonably way out in the galaxies, but not to the full extent. Um, spectral resolution was high in the red, about 30 kilometers a second in dispersion. Um, but low in the blue, so we could have full wavelength coverage in the blue, about 70 kilometers a second. And that turns out to have some limitations, and which is one of the key things that Hector will do. And the key science for the SAMI is really around um, the physical processes responsible for galaxy transformations, uh, the buildup of mass and angular momentum, and how gas gets into and leaves galaxies, right? So really, these core issues around galaxy formation is, is what we're after with SAMI. Um, so a summary of where what we've done the last 12 months or so, um, we've continued to publish a lot of papers with the final TAMI data sets um, and obviously had a lot of Zoom meetings. I think this is from our, the, the Zoom picture there is from a, a meeting last year now. Uh, we'll ha hopefully go, go back to in-person meetings, um, currently planning a meeting probably in September. There's a joint SAMI and Hector uh, busy week. But lots and lots of papers. Um, I think we published 14 papers last year as a team. We published, I think, five or six this year already. Um, and I won't talk about all of these, obviously, because there isn't time, but also there's a large number of people who are speaking about various aspects of these. We heard a few yesterday. Uh, we'll hear more today. I just want to highlight a couple of points. Um, I think we're working on more advanced approaches now um, because we've got this full and rich data set. So, Julia talked about the Swatch Star modeling yesterday. I think that's a, you know, a very powerful technique. The other thing we're doing is now interfacing the SAMI data with other data sets, including the legacy data set from ESO, the Magpie survey, <coughs> and also H1 data. So Bob Cathnella, with Cortez and Watts um, have built up this SAMI H1 data set. Again, I think Adam is talking later in the, the meeting, so I won't dwell on on that, but there's a you know, rich array of science happening. Um, and also, of course, we had several students finishing, so Tanya, Stefania, and Julia uh, both finished in about last year. Or maybe Tanya finished a little bit early before that, but um, you know, really, really successful, all moving on to sort of great positions. Um, so that's really, really nice to see. So what I'm gonna do is just give you a, a few highlights, not, not all the highlights, um, but I wanted to, Highlight this work from Tanya that was published early this year. Um, here, really built on Tanya Sammy work where she was looking to see how stellar populations in terms of metallicity and age varied across the mass size plane, uh, and finding that metallicity correlates best with something that's close to potential, basically M on R, whereas age correlates best with um, mass over R squared, something more like mass surface density. And so we want to see what that looked like at high redshift and legacy survey and legacies of VLT VMOS public survey uh, led by Arjun van der Vel. And what we saw, or what Tanya saw, um, is that at high redshift 0.6.7, 
We're also seeing the same metallicity trends that go with potential that we, that we saw in the lower redshift with SAMI. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can just see the plots of mass versus size, um, color-coded by potential, sorry, color-coded by metallicity. The dashed lines, the diagonal dashed lines are lines of constant potential or constant over R. You can see the metallicity tracks those very, very well. This is a really interesting result. Um, there's other things in, in, about age um, in this paper as well. It's, it's a really great bit of work, but I won't dwell on that because there, we haven't got time to talk about everything. Another aspect of metallicity that we looked at is a really nice bit of work by Amelia, who, who is going to talk after me, but I think on a different subject. And Amelia compared the gas and stellar metallicities in the SAMI galaxies and found some really interesting trends in that the difference between gas and stellar metallicity, um, this delta Z G star here, this trends with specific star formation rate, but also stellar mass and star formation uh, and stellar surface entity. And this is one of the first times that this comparison has really been done properly in terms of trying to compare stellar and gas metallicities. It's complicated to do because there's a lot of calibration issues to try to sort out. Uh, but there, there are real offsets here, which are actually telling us about the enrichment history of galaxies, which is really interesting. Um, the other thing I'll flag about this paper is the referee's report from it was one of the best I've ever seen. Um, the referee here said the paper had been joyful. Um, a joyful, interesting, and very pleasant read. So I'm mean, sort of, you know, hats off to Amelia. Well done. I think it's, a, I mean, I think the referee was obviously impressed and the rest of us were too. Another paper that's just been submitted uh, is by PhD student Lee Wang uh, at Sydney. Um, and this is looking to, fig to figure out the, the, the timescales of environmental quenching uh, in both groups and clusters. And so this is a very busy plot. Um, so I'll try to explain it simply. Each panel is basically the light weighted age as a function of radius, and each point is a bin of radius in individual SAMI galaxies. And the points are color coded by the global star formation, specific star formation rate of each galaxy. Um, and uh, in the top panel are just regular galaxies. Can you see my cursor? Hopefully you can. Um, you have the regular decline in star formation um, in age as you go from the center to the edge. Galaxies are typically older in the center. But what we did was pick a population of star formation concentrated galaxies uh, from SAMI using the H alpha and looked to see what their age profiles were like. Now, the most interesting point here is particularly in groups. So these are the vertical beams are different environments. So isolated low mass groups, groups and clusters. And in high mass groups in particular, what you see is that the concentrated galaxies, and that's the mean relation in gray here, are offset and are tilted up with respect to the, the regular galaxies. They have much older outskirts. Now, of course, you expect that because you've selected things that are star formation concentrated, but you don't see that in any of the other environments. So, and what it's pointing towards is a partial quenching of galaxies in groups where the outskirts are being shut down, but the centers don't shut down the star formation for quite some time, up to sort of a few giga years. The other bit of science I want to mention very briefly is something we're, again, it's currently work, very much work in progress, but it's trying to bring together a lot of the work we've done um, by you know, many people, Yessa, Amelia, Sarah Bruff, um, Luca, uh, and Tom, and others, trying to understand the nature of galaxy spin. Um, so this is a topic that we have uh, focused on significantly within SAMI, uh, largely thanks to the, the exquisite stellar kinematics catalog that YES has produced. He's been a, a leader in this. And the, the thing that's most striking when we, when we look at this data in multiple dimensions, uh, and here what I've plotted is the spin, lambda r versus age, low-weighted age. And so you can see there's a beautiful um, track where spin declines as you get to older galaxies. Um, but what the points are color coded by is environment. And the orange points or red points are high density environments and the blue points are low density environments. And I think hopefully the point here is that the, there's a striking lack of any environmental trend once you take out the age trend. So this is work 
particularly in collaboration with Yesa, uh, Sam Bourne and Nick Scott, who provided the, the stellar population work. This lack of a residual correlation with the environment suggests that the spin evolution, at least at face value, the spin evolution could be dr just driven by secular effects or gender bias, not directly by environment. Um, but we're still working on interpreting this in, in detail. So that's Hector science, but I really, really, sorry, that's Sammy science, but I really now want to focus on Hector because Hector's now on the telescope. Hector, of course, is uh, led by Julia Bryant, both instrument and the survey. And Hector increases the number of IFUs, up to 21 IFUs, but most importantly, it has this higher resolution spectrograph called Spectre. Um, and this changes a lot of the science you can do um, with this instrument. And there's also a new robotic positioning system. Um, and so there's a, there's a, this, is a, this is a very complex instrument. Um, it's been commissioned uh, right now. First light was in December. Commissioning is essentially complete. A large number of the team are up the telescope right now finalizing commissioning, mostly because the weather has been very awful. Um, I just wanted to point out some of the key people in the Hector team. Um, yes, sir. Who, who's been you know, focused on cellular kinematics and, and also observing. Shri, whose data reduction and observing coordination. Stefania, who has been, as well as observing, has, is, is managing our wiki and other aspects. Madusha on data reduction. Sam on the target selection and observing. Um, these are our sort of key young people um, who are really driving Hector along. And I just want to hi highlight, there are many other people, but I want to highlight those guys as well as obviously Julie in the middle um, because they really are a key aspect of making this work. And of course, they're all Astros review people. So Hector now is on the AAT. The picture on the left there is, is the team seeing the first emission lines appear from um, data observing a galaxy, I think. Back in February, uh, back in December, you'll see that the weather has not been particularly kind to us. Sam sent this to me just a night or two ago. This is the Met system saying there's 102 uh, kilometer an hour gusts of wind at the telescope at the moment. Not so fun. And here is a zoom in of um, hectare IFUs on the focal plane. Now, if this looks a bit familiar to you, um, this always reminds me of one of these things, which of course is one of the sentinels from the Matrix. Um, a little less deadly, I hope. So we have now beautiful data from Hector. This is literally a raw data frame, but just one single um, shot. So you can still see the cosmic rays and things like that. You can also see obviously the emission lines uh, and the changing position with wavelength because of the kinematics. The data looks very, very nice. Here's another few snapshots of spectra. The high resolution is, it's, it's really, really helps us significantly in a lot of the science we're doing. Um, and you can start to see things like asymmetric line profiles in some of the uh, emission line galaxies where you can really resolve so the stellar kinematics very well. So it's looking very, very good. Um, just to give you a sense of the performance of the spectrographs, the magenta and cyan lines are um, twilight sky frames with um, the new spect spectrographs. Blue and red are the old Omega spectrographs. You can see not only is the wavelength coverage slightly larger, um, but the, res the response of, of the spectra blue spectrograph is, is much, much better than Omega, which is excellent. The resolution is also much, much better. You can see this comparison here between Omega in the dark blue and spectra in the cyan. And the resolution is critical, right? Because that allows you to do things like spectrally dissolved Milky Way disks in, uh, as you do high order kinematics, look at resolving outflows in key emission lines, and look at stellar um, kinematics, particularly of dwarfs and low mass. Um, so last thing I'll say is currently what we're focused on is Hector first science. So that means looking at low mass dwarf galaxies, kinematic properties of Milky Way analogs, inflows and outflows at large radius using the bigger IFUs, and transitioning galaxies that are infalling from large radius. Um, and so I'll stop there because um, I've probably run it out or over time, but there's much work to be done. The most exciting thing is this massive transition from Sammy to Hector, um, and we'll be getting something like 80 to 100 nights in the AAT over the next few years per year um, to really make 
a huge amount of headway into the Hector survey. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you.